All right, thanks, thanks for coming. It's, it's, it's a really awesome conference. I've been having a really good time, and I've met a lot of new people, and everybody's awesome, and it's, it's just a lot of fun. Um, oh, let me do this. Sweet, okay, so my name's Rob. Uh, I work for the Gemini Observatory, so I write Scala programs uh, that help scientists use this machine. Uh, it's on top of the mountain in Hawaii. There's another one in Chile. Dick, yes? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, we have, we have space lasers. We do. Uh, artificial guide star. I, I can explain it to you later. Okay. Uh, this is my only uh, visually interesting star uh, uh, slide, so I, I apologize for that. All right. So, um, okay, so what's this about? Um, so this is talk about Doobie, which is a pure functional database layer for Scala. I've been working on it uh, in my spare time for a couple of years now. Um, we've had some releases. Uh, there are people using it. Uh, so today, I just kind of want to talk about how it works and, and why I think it's interesting. Uh, so the takeaways, I think, for, for this talk are, are first and foremost, uh, JDBC is terrible. This is not JDBC's fault, really. It has an impossible task. You, you cannot abstract over every possible uh, relational database and, and, and end up with something that's satisfying. So uh, we just, but this is Scala, so we can improve on it a lot. Uh, free monads are awesome. If you saw David Hoyt's talk yesterday, you already know this, um, but you'll get a chance to see some of these things uh, from a different direction. The, uh, the big idea that I want to get across is that we should really be uh, leaning on composition uh, as the primary tool for constructing programs uh, because composition sort of naturally keeps complexity in check. Uh, it's it's uh, really nice if you can do it. Operational thinking really doesn't scale very well. Um, oh, and and this technique that I'm using here uh, is very general, and it's it's actually quite mechanical. Uh, so even if you're not in the market for a database layer, uh, there may be something here that you can use to make some terrible thing in your life uh, go away, to sweep something under the rug, uh, which we do all the time. All right, so let's talk about what's wrong with JDBC. Uh, so here's a little program. Uh, so what does it do? We got a, a case class, a person that has a name and an age. Uh, we have a method that takes a result set and it reads a string from the first column, an int from the second column, constructs a person and returns it. Okay. So uh, this is how we would write it in Java and it looks okay. Uh, but what's wrong with it? Um, there are actually quite a few things. So the first thing is uh, this result set that we're passing in. This is a lifetime managed object, okay? So if you leak it by assigning it to a var or letting it hop onto a future somewhere, then you're kind of breaking the contract. You're holding onto this reference longer than uh, the person calling this method is expecting, okay? So the loner pattern that we're using here by giving you a result set and, and doing something, with it, it's just not safe in this context. Uh, obviously, uh, we have side effects, right? So the methods on result set are uh, dependent on the internal state of the result set. Uh, they might not return the same value when you uh, call them again later. Uh, and they can throw exceptions. They can throw lots of exceptions. Uh, and, and it's not obviously uh, composable. I don't see anything here that really looks like a composable abstraction. It's just sort of side effecting uh, imperative procedure calling. Okay, so m my claim here is that the way we deal with this uh, in a sane way is by turning this program into a data structure. Uh, and you're just gonna have to trust me for a few slides, uh, and, and I think I can demonstrate uh, that this is a useful thing to do. All right, so here's our strategy. So we're gonna identify the primitive operations we care about, and we're gonna turn them into values. Uh, we're just gonna make a data type. And these are gonna be our smallest meaningful programs. Uh, and then we're going to make some rules for sticking them together to build bigger programs. And then we're going to build an interpreter that takes these programs and you can turn the crank and it'll connect to a database and actually do something useful. Okay? So what does that look like? Okay, so the first thing we want to do is define a data type uh, for the operations. And here we're just going to use as an example the operations that you can perform on a result set. Okay? so. Uh, we have a, a, a sealed trait, we have all these cases, we have basically one constructor uh, for each method on the result set. Uh, this type parameter captures the return type. Uh, so 
we can think of these little values that we can construct as just little programs. They describe something that we want to do. And, and we could imagine uh, maybe putting uh, a bunch of these in a list. And then you could write an interpreter that takes a result set and takes a list of these things. And then uh, you turn the crank and it, it just calls uh, corresponding methods on the result set and maybe it captures the, the results of those calls in a list of any or something, right? So that's not very useful, but in principle, that's kind of what we want to do. We want to have the, uh, the program as a piece of data that we can work with easily and separate that from, from the process of, of, of actually running it. Um, stuffing things in a list isn't very useful, so we, we need a better way to put these things together. So let's talk about that. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about some operations for composing these things that I claim are, are gonna be useful. So, if we have a program that returns something of type A, another program that returns something of type B, something that I claim is useful to do is to take those two results and combine them together using some function yielding a program that returns a value of some type C. Uh, we might wanna have a program that takes this C and then just turns it into something else, just applies a function and, and you get a new program that returns a value of type D. Uh, you might, if you have a program that computes something of type D, you might wanna look at the result and based on what it is, uh, figure out what you're gonna do next, either go this way or go that way. And then you might just wanna say, uh, I, I know what I want this program to compute, just some arbitrary value. Ignore the result set, just, just give me some value, right? And you probably see what I'm doing here, right? So this is monadic unit. Uh, this is flat map. This may not be how you think about flat map, but fundamentally that's what it is. It allows you to look at the result of a computation to, de to determine what the next computation should be. This is just map and this is apply to, which is one of the applicative uh, uh, composition tools. Okay? So what we want is a monad. Okay? Uh, if we had a monad for result set op, then we could write this program this way. Okay, so you could say, okay, get a name from get string, get an age from get int, construct a person and yield it and, and you know, have a result set op of person. Uh, so that gives us much better compositional potential than just stuffing things in a list or a tree or something. Um, but we don't have a monad, so we can't do this. Okay? Um, but what if we could borrow one? Okay? Um, so, other talks have touched on this, which is good, so you're, you're probably warmed up and I'm gonna kinda uh, buzz through it. So Scholarset has this type called free, and free is a monad for any functor f that you give it. There's another type called coyoneta, uh, which is a functor for any s that you give it, okay? Um, by substitution, free of coyoneta of something with one type hole in it is a monad. Uh, and Scholarset abbreviates this as, as free c, because it's a, it's a useful type. Okay, so if S is result set op, now we have a monad. Well, what, is, I mean, what does that mean, right? We have a, a result set op is not a monad, but we have a monad for it somehow in this other structure. So that was really puzzling to me when I was first messing with this stuff. So I, I wanna talk about uh, what that looks like. Okay, so what we do is we have this new type, and we'll call it result set IO. And it's just an alias for free of coyoneta of result set op, which is just that simple data type we defined a minute ago. So for each constructor of result set op, we have a corresponding constructor uh, for result set IO, and it just uses this liftfc function that ScalaZ gives us. And that constructs a value of type result set IO. And result set IO uh, has a monad. It's a free monad. Okay, so result set op is not a monad, right? It's not even a functor. It's just, it's just a dumb data structure with no operations but result set IO is a monad, and you see that this is correspondence between the constructors of result set IO and result set op. So now, we can write this program we want using this result set IO type. So we can say, uh, get a name, you know, from get string, get a name, from get int, get an age, and then yield a person, and we have something of result set IO of person, and this compiles, it's just uh, constructing a piece of data. It's not actually doing anything. So if we compare this to, this, to the first sort of Java style program we looked at, uh, we can see some improvements, right? So first of all, these are values. Uh, this is referentially transparent. That's a var, that's not a def. It's just a piece of data. It doesn't do anything. Uh, there's no result set, uh, 
you don't have a, you can't leak a reference because you don't have a reference. A result set does not appear in any of the types in this program. Okay, and now we're composing, right? We have these two little programs, we're putting them together and we're making a bigger program. And we can do this indefinitely, right? And, and, and you'll always have something of type result set IO of something, okay? So uh, the surface complexity remains the same as we do this composition. That's what composition means. That's, that's effective composition, okay? Now, we still can't do anything with this program. We can't run it, and we're gonna get to that. But uh, first I wanna talk about some of the other operations you get beyond just four comprehensions, just as a consequence of having this monad available. Okay, so uh, all monads are functors, so this green operation is map. So in this example, we can say, all right, if we have an operation, a program that will get us a long value at some column offset, we can just take that and map it and take the value and use it to construct a Java date. So now we have a way to construct a program that will read a date from, uh, from an arbitrary column. And that's all there is to it. Uh, and there are some other interesting operations you get uh, that I won't talk about. Okay, what else? So all monads are also applicative functors. Uh, so you have this, uh, uh, you have a lot of operations, but this, this apply to uh, is a useful one. And you also have uh, this operation. So we can write our program this way. We can say, get a string at offset one, Cinnabon, get an int at offset two, and we combine those and construct a person. And this is equivalent to the program we had before. Because the get string and the get int have no data dependency between them, uh, we don't need a monad. We can use this weaker construction. Okay, so that's, that's fine. So what else can we do with, with, uh, with applicative? Well, one thing we can do is we can say, let's say we have a program that moves to the next row and tells us yes, no, is there another row? We'll just run that and assume optimistically there's another row, throw the Boolean away, and then just call get person and uh, return the result. So we're composing these things together and just ignoring the result uh, on the left. Okay, so what else can we do? Well, we can do this. Now we can take that get next person then we can replicate it some number of times, and uh, now we have a program that will fetch a list of people. Okay, and that's kind of cool. All right, so how does that work? Okay, so first we make a list of programs. That's easy, we just call list.fill and pass the program in. Then we do the most awesome thing in all of functional programming, we call sequence, and that flips the type constructors, right? So now, instead of having a, a list of programs, we have a program that computes a list, which is what we want, okay? This is possible, uh, yeah, that's awesome. So this is possible um, because uh, result set IO is an applicative functor, but also because list is a traversable functor. Uh, so if you don't know about applicative and traversable functors, learn about them, I, I get really excited about them. It's, it's great stuff. Um, okay, so let, let's pause for just a second and, and think about what we've been doing, right? So we're really just following the types. Um, we're, we're using these uh, compositional operations and working with uh, these programs just like any other kind of data, right? It's really cool. We're not thinking about operational concerns. Where's the result set going? And, and you know, how am I looping and all that? Uh, we're just sticking things together and following the types. And these operations are just a consequence uh, of having that monad instance. Uh, but we haven't gotten to monad yet. So what does monad give us on top of this? So what it allows us to do is look at the result of running a program and determine what program to run next. Okay, so now we can branch. So that next program that returns a Boolean, we can say if it's true, uh, then the next thing we're gonna do is get person and we'll lift it up into option. Otherwise, uh, we'll just construct a program that returns none, okay? So you can define a combinator called ifm uh, that captures this pattern. And someone was talking about it yesterday, Michael, maybe. Um, so with applicative, we could, uh, we could iterate for some number of given steps, right? Uh, but now, since we can look at the results, we can stop an iteration based on some computed value. So we can do this, we can say, uh, get person while m vector next. So what that means is, as long as this next program is yielding true values, we'll get a person, and then we're gonna accumulate the results in a vector, okay? And this is, this is legit, right? Th this is a totally legit way to read a result set into a vector of some structured data type, 
Okay? And I, I think it's just a really beautiful way to express our intent of what we want to do. There's nothing extraneous. Uh, and uh, there's a accumulate combinator that's built into Doobie that's implemented basically in exactly this way. Okay. So we can write these little programs with these made up data type and this functor that we got out of nowhere, or the monad we got out of nowhere. Um, and they're pure values and they have these nice compositional properties, but we need to actually run them at some point. So let's talk about that. So to run our program, what we're gonna do is we're gonna interpret, we're gonna interpret it into some real monad, uh, something like IO or Scala Z, uh, Scala Z task. So we'll, we'll sort of give up this monad we borrowed and in exchange for a real one. So to do this, we need to provide a mapping from result set op to our target monad. So IO or task typically. Um, and this is called a natural transformation. And astonishingly, I'm at least the third speaker to mention natural transformations at this conference, which I'm really excited about. Okay, so, uh, so what does this look like? So here we go. So given a result set, we can construct a natural transformation from result set op to IO. Okay? So for each constructor of result set op, remember this is the, the thing we defined on like slide three. For each constructor there, uh, we map it to a corresponding IO primitive in IO that operates on that result set. Okay? So that's very mechanical. Okay, now what? Well now we can write this method. Okay? So given a program written in free C, which is our uh, result set IO program, plus this natural transformation we just defined, we get an IO back, okay? So this program here uh, that uh, reads the result set into a vector, uh, you can actually run it now. You give it uh, a result set and call in safe perform IO, and you get a normal Scala vector of person, okay? So that's kind of, that kind of closes the loop. So, an interesting thing here to me is, is that um, we never had to explain how to map or flat map anything, which is, which is really interesting. We borrowed some machinery that let us pretend for a while that we could do this, and then uh, we just trade it in at some point by translating it to another monad. Uh, and we never have to directly implement that machinery, which I think is, is, is really cool. All right, so uh, let's talk about Doobie, uh, finally. So what is it? Well, it's, it's basically, what I just showed you, but it's for all of JDBC. So this gives you a pure functional sort of substrate uh, for all the primitive operations that JDBC supports. So if you need access to weird vendor specific stuff, uh, it's there, you can just, you can get to it and it's built in this nice compositional way all the way up. Uh, there's no ugly plumbing underneath, it's, it's nice all the way down. Uh, now, it might have occurred to you that what I've been doing is very mechanical, right? We're just like making this data type that corresponds to an interface and then a natural transformation. Uh, and it is mechanical. In fact, the, the core uh, of Doobie is machine generated. So uh, the free algebras, the interpreters are all machine generated. And that accounts for about 70% of the Scala Z, or the, for, of the uh, Doobie core. So I have written like 2,200 lines of code and the rest is spat out by a computer, so that's pretty nice. Okay, so what we've seen so far has nice compositional properties, uh, but it's still very low level. Uh, it, it would be a pain to write programs using this. So uh, I wanna show you very quickly some of the higher level stuff that, I, uh, that I've built up on top of it, and then at the end I'll give you a pointer to a reference where you can see some other, some other things that, that, that uh, Doobie can do. Okay, so one of, the, one of the important things is exception handling. So uh, all the exception handling is based on these two primitives, attempt and fail. So uh, attempt takes a program that computes some value of type A and turns it into a program, or it, it, it constructs a program that computes a throwable or A. So you can do that to say, okay, at this point, uh, I want to trap exceptions and, and, and take a look at them. Uh, the fail, uh, combinator just induces a failure. So uh, it's, if you want to rethrow, for instance, you, you would use that combinator. And from those two primitives, we can construct all this other stuff. So we have uh, general purpose handlers for dealing with just arbitrary exceptions. Uh, they're ones that are specific to SQL exceptions and SQL states, because that's what we're normally gonna be running into. 
uh, for Postgres, and so one of the reasons Postgres is awesome is they actually publish a table of all of the errors uh, and the corresponding SQL states. So uh, we can generate combinators here that you can use that are very that are specific to Postgres but can catch any of these hundreds of specific errors, which is really nice, because otherwise you just have to look at the SQL state, which is a string, which is awful, and, and uh, so that's a reason to use Postgres right there. Okay, so uh, another thing. Uh, so here we're reading a string from column one and in from column two. This is Scala, so we can abstract over the return type there just by using a type class. Uh, we can generalize that to tuples, so now we can just say we're gonna read a string and then an int from column one. Uh, using shapeless, we can genera generalize that to uh, product types, so we can just say we're gonna read a person from column one. Uh, okay, this for comprehension doesn't do anything anymore, so it's just this. And when you're reading a row, you're always, you're always gonna start at column one, right? So we can default that away. So really, this program we've been trying to write this whole time, that's how you would write it in Doobie, right? Okay. Okay, so, um, so that's how you can read a value from a row. So let's talk about how you deal with a bunch of rows, which is what you're usually doing. So uh, we've seen this program before, right? Uh, this is written with our, with our type class notation. It just says get a person as long as there's another row and collect them into a list. Uh, but another way we can do it is we can say, I just want a process of person. And what that gives us is a Scala Z stream process. The effect type is results that I O and what it's yielding to you is uh, person objects, okay? So what can we do with that? Well, we can say we want a filter, take, drop, fork, join, send stuff out to a socket, whatever, you know, whatever we want. And then when we finally run that, okay, in this case by just saying dot list, which says, okay, well, what I wanna do is collect all the results into a list, what we get back is a program. It's exactly the same type as the, uh, uh, that's returned by the method uh, at the top of the page, okay? So this lets you sort of jump into stream world and define these nice transformations, uh, and then when you run it, you're just back where you started. Uh, so it's a really nice way to sort of jump in and out of, of, of the streaming world. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, all right, sorry. Um, so we've talked about result sets, but there are a lot of other sort of contexts that you have to operate in. There, there are connection pools, connections, statements. Um, so the, the, the structure of a database program typically looks something like this. There's kind of a natural nesting you have. You have a connection pool that probably lasts the lifetime of your application. Uh, you have these interactions with the database that, that allocate a connection and do some things with it, execute some statements, maybe get result sets that you have to deal with. And in Doobie, programs written in these different contexts have different types. They have, they have different sets of operations that are legal, okay? So, but Doobie allows you to, start to click these things together to make bigger programs that handle these large interactions that have this nesting structure. Uh, and, and, and some of these patterns are so common that there's a very high level API that just does the whole thing for you. So you don't have to, to look at the, the nesting structure directly. So let's look at that. All right, so, let me back up. All right, so here we have a country object that has a name, a code, population. Uh, we can use this uh, string interpolation thing uh, to construct a query and it says, okay, we'll select code name GMP from country where population is greater than this value. Okay, now this, this gets turned into a prepared statement and that dollar sign whatever turns into a question mark and there's a properly typed call to set int at index one uh, because everything's one indexed in, in JDBC. Uh, so, so that's safe, that's not a SQL injection risk. What this thing is gonna yield is values of type country, uh, and we can view this query thing in, in, in a couple ways, and we'll, we'll look at this. So here's a REPL session, so we can say bigger than uh, 100 million, I think. And we can say, okay, I wanna look at, as a, look at this as a process. So we have a Scala Z stream process, the effect type is connection IO, which means we're uh, all the way up at the very top, this is something that needs a connection order, in order to run. Uh, we'll take the first five, collect them as a list, and now we have a connection I.O. of list person, similar to what we saw a minute ago. Uh, then we call transact, and I don't have time to talk about this, but there's this thing called a transactor, and it just abstracts over connection pools. That's basically all it does. This is something that knows how to uh, produce a database connection uh, and, uh, and 
put transact put commits and, uh, at the end and, and roll back and, and all that stuff. So we do that. And once we transact it, we just get a Scala Z task, in this case, of list person. All the Doobie stuff is gone now, right? We're just back in normal Scala Z land. We have a task, and when we run it, it goes out and connects to the database and gets the first five things through the stream and gathers them up and does all that, closes the stream, uh, cleans everything up, and returns you the list of person. And then we're just printing them out. Uh, so this is fine. In the REPL, uh, this is kind of a pain. You don't want to have to do this every time. So we have YOLO mode uh, that lets you say, okay, I, I, I want this transactor to sort of be the ambient one that I'm going to be using. Uh, and then instead of, then you can just say dot quick dot run and it'll just print out the results to the, to the console. So this is good for experimentation. Another nice thing you can do with YOLO is you can type check your queries. So instead of in quick, saying quick dot run, you can say check dot run. And it'll go out and talk to the database, and it'll make sure the SQL compiles. It'll make sure the parameters, uh, the arity lines up, and that the types match up. So uh, there's one problem here, uh, that the GNP can actually be null in the database, and we didn't know that. So it advises us, okay, uh, we can fix this. We can, we can either make the col column not, uh, not null in the database, or we can use an option type. Uh, on the Scala side. So it, it doesn't just say something's wrong, it tries to give you hints about, uh, about how to fix it, which, which is useful, I think. Oh, and you can do this in your unit test too. So there's a, I have a specs trait uh, that you can just mix in that allows you to do this in your tests. And it would be trivial to do it for a Scala check or whatever, I just, uh, nobody's offered to do that yet. Or a Scala test, rather. Okay, um, there's a lot of other stuff. Um, so type mapping is very, very simple. If you saw uh, Michael's talk yesterday on uh, S codec, uh, he had this codec type with invariant mapping, and basically column mapping in, in Doobie works the same way. So it's, it's very, very simple uh, to map arbitrary things into columns, and uh, arbitrary things across column vectors as well. Um, connection pooling, uh, so, uh, I, there's an implementation uh, for Hikari that, that comes with Duby. Uh, it's very easy to use any kind of connection pool you want. It's, that's, that's not a big deal at all. Uh, these types are kind of fancy. Um, if you're familiar with Scala Z streams, you know there's not a dot list thing that you can call that says gather everything into a list. So that was syntax that was added. So here and there, uh, I've added syntax to make these fancy types a little easier to deal with. Uh, the Postgres support, I, I think, so I, I'm, I'm, I try to be very modest about this, but I'm really proud of the Postgres support. I think it's the better support than any other database library I know of. Um, support, you know, all these geometric types, PostGIS, listen and notify, which is really cool because you can, you can make the database tell you when something changes, uh, and you can view these notifications as a stream, of course. So it's, 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 uh, it, it all clicks together really nicely. Um, and, but it does work with any JDBC driver. So people using H2, MySQL, MS SQL. Um, I have a crazy friend who's using it with Apache Hive, which is just this horrible, like this really terrible, like degenerate JDBC driver. It doesn't do anything. Um, but if you just like kind of crank the volume down, uh, you can get it to work. And he's, he's using it with Doobie and really likes it better than, than the native interface. So that's, that's a lot of fun. Um, so I've kind of zoomed through this. Uh, I have a little time for questions. Well, let, let me talk a little bit about, about uh, support. So um, th there are a couple things that bother me about libraries. One of them is that the, there's no documentation or the documentation uh, is out of date. So uh, I wrote a tool called TUT that, that uh, you use to type check the documentation for your project. And if the examples in your doc don't compile, then your project doesn't build. Uh, so I wrote that in order to write the Doobie documentation. So the book of Doobie is full of examples and explanations and everything works. If you copy and paste the code examples from the page, they will actually work, which is, which is great. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and there's a Gitter channel too. So it's a small community still. Um, if you have a question, I'm probably the only person who can answer it, so I try to be responsive. Uh, on the Gitter channel there. So if you want to try it out and you, you have trouble with something, please ask. It's, it's important to me that you, that people who are trying it feel like they have a fighting chance to, to, to be successful with it. Um, and that's all I got. So questions? Yes. Um, 
I don't know what that is. Oh, asking about, it, would it be applicable to Sleepy Cat, but I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, so um, Doobie is very specific to JDBC, right? So the, the, the goal is to take JDBC and make it usable and then just see what happens sort of riffing on it. What can we build on top of it? But the technique I described is totally applicable to that, that kind of thing. Uh, and you might even be able to take the code generator from Doobie and give it some tweaks and get it to, to spit out some of this, uh, some of this code for you. Um, uh, a friend of mine in, in, in uh, uh, Portland is, is thinking about trying to do this for Cassandra, in fact. And, and Cassandra is a huge API. It's much, much bigger than JDBC, so it's going to be hard. Um, kind of the saving grace of JDBC is that it's so dumb. Like, it, it, it doesn't really do very much. It doesn't really have any, any abstractions. So that's nice. It gives us a, a very clean sort of floor we can build on top of. It might be harder with, with other APIs. Yes? Uh, you can get, you can do whatever you want. So um, when you define a query, uh, you it doesn't infer the return type. You have to assert the return type. Um, so you can say, uh, I want, you know, uh, uh, I want this thing as an H list, or I want it as a shapeless record. That works. You can say I want it as this one case class, or a nesting of case classes and tuples, or, or whatever. So. Um, uh, you have a lot of choices in, in how you do that, whatever makes sense for you. Yes? Yes. No, listen. Uh, so uh, the listen notify stuff is specific to, to, to Postgres. Um, and it's integrated with the, uh, with the transaction. So sending, sending a notification is a transactional operation that doesn't actually happen until, until commit time. Uh, so it doesn't work with any other databases. Um, in terms of hooking in with something like reactive streams, uh, it's probably possible, but I don't know. I've never looked at reactive streams, so I, I couldn't tell you. I was talking to somebody about it yesterday, uh, Dean, I think, and, and uh, it seems possible. It just Somebody needs to look at it. Yeah, Eric. So those of us who are really into like functional programming might not want to use it, but it sort of seems like one of the saving graces you mentioned is that GDBC has this really small, dumb, usable API, and if it actually is really present in the complexity of that, it actually be harder to use. Do you think that kind of makes up your argument that you kind of want to have these kind of small, really dumb things that are going to be I think, well, I mean, I think just, just sort of as a general principle of, of software engineering, I want, I want the smallest, I, I, I want these low-level operations, I want the, the absolute base of what I need to do, and then I want to build stuff up on top of it. Um, and, and yeah, so that's what I prefer to see when I'm working on stuff. I, you know, I, I prefer to build stuff up by combining. Um, but yeah, like if you, if you tried to do, use this technique like on Swing, for example, it would just be a nightmare. It would take, you know, it, you could never do it because there are all these awful abstractions that you would have to like beat down um, before you got down to a set of operations that really made sense. Um, however, uh, you could do this for like uh, Graphics 2D and a fine transform and stuff like that because those are nice flat APIs and that would work totally fine. Yes? yes. You, uh, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, so finish it, finish it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the question is, you, you end up with Scala Z task, is, is there any other option? Uh, yes, there is. Um, it, it will work with uh, any, the, the, the interpreter that, that is provided will work with uh, any, any IO-like type, right? So you need a type that can capture side affecting expressions and turn them into values, right? So you couldn't do it with standard library future because you can't do that with future, but you can do it with task, you can do it with IO, um, there's this remoting system called Remotely that, that Stu and those guys work on, uh, and there's, um, uh, 
there's a type like a response type uh, that works that works this way. So I was able to set up Doobie so that it could uh, send results back over remotely with one line of code, literally one line of code to 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 connect them together. Now there's a bigger question: is can you provide another interpreter that does something totally different? Like you can mock out the whole database, for instance, with another interpreter. You're welcome to do that. Um, it's just going to be a lot of work. That's the problem because there are thousands and thousands of operations. Uh, like a callable statement has like over 200 operations that it supports. So it'll be a big interpreter, but you can certainly do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have time. Okay. Yeah. One more. Um, okay, so the, the question was about um, native support for JSON, which, which uh, Postgres has. Um, yeah, so uh, Doobie deals with that just fine. Um, there's an example in the documentation that shows how you can uh, read stuff in uh, using Argonaut and then use, and then use um, Argonaut's deserializers to further turn that into real type. So it just sort of uses Argonaut as the intermediary to interpret the JSON that you're getting back. Um, yeah, it's in the book, I, in the type mapping chapter. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Okay, so the, the question was about resource safety. How do we guarantee that uh, how do we guarantee that result sets and streams and stuff get closed? Um, so some databases are, are are cool, and you just close the connection and it cleans everything up. There are databases like Oracle where you got to close everything in exactly the right order, or it'll leak and the guy in suspenders will come and yell at you. Um, so um, I, I talked briefly. Let's see about, about uh, this business uh, where you're embedding, you're lifting programs. Uh, from one context up into the other. And at each point, uh, there is a lifetime managed resource that's involved. So um, when you have a result set program, uh, well, let's, say, let's say we have a prepared statement program, and when you execute, uh, you're gonna get a result set. And you use that result set uh, in order to lift this result set program in and, and click them together. And in the process, uh, it attaches an, a, a, a a handler using that exception handling stuff I talked about that guarantees that no matter what you do, uh, that's always going to be closed. Now, I think you had another question about maybe you don't want the connection to be closed uh, when you're done. Uh, and you don't have to use this transactor business that, that, that does that. You can just say, here's my connection, here's a connection IO program, go, and that'll work fine. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Okay, great. Anyone else? Yes. Okay, so the, the, the question was about uh, type safety in the queries, and, and I had this check method um, that does go out to the database and uh, uh, it, it checks and verifies that the, uh, uh, the types that you've asserted line up with, with what the database is actually reporting. Um, and yeah, and that's a runtime thing. It has to talk to the database. Um, but it could be done at compile time, and uh, uh, SQL types does that, and I think Slick3 uh, will do that for you. Um, and they can infer the return types uh, as well by doing that. Uh, it makes the build a little more complicated. Um, it, you have to have a database connection or your code won't compile. Um, so I've thought about doing that, but I, I, I think uh, I, I personally prefer to kind of defer that as, as sort of a, a something I can stuff in the unit tests. Once I get it right, I just have this sanity check that runs every time I run the test and ensures everything's right. But that's a, that's a totally uh, valid concern. I think that's a, it's a valid argument on both sides of that. Yes.
Mm -hmm. I don't have anything similar in Dewey. Um, I mean, you could certainly start to build stuff up uh, from from where I am, but I'm I'm one guy. <laughs> slick is slick is like a full time guy uh, who's really smart. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so they they have a lot of really clever stuff going on in Slick, and and I think that if you haven't looked at Slick lately, the stuff they've done, done in Slick three is really good. So if you're a Slick user, you should definitely check it out. Your your life will be a lot happier. Anyone else? I think we're about done. Okay, thanks a lot.